apple season here in the Bay Area. Uh, right here behind me I've got one just beautiful Fuji apple completely loaded with fruit. Uh, the Fuji probably won't be ready for picking until about October but this is definitely the time of the year that we're going to go through. We're going to look for the earliest varieties of apples in the orchard uh, which there are a few that are ripe and ready to pick right now. Uh, we're going to look for damage from worms in the apples. We don't want any codling moth damage from a second generation in here, so we go through and thin out the damaged apples. Otherwise, it's just a good time to uh, inventory our fruit and take a look at how it's growing uh, and decide what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong in the apple orchard. I'd say it's pretty clear that whatever it is um, I've been doing around here with apples that uh, I'm probably on the right track because the fruit load is huge, the trees really can't hold up much more weight. Um, the pruning system that I'm using in these trees is one that I developed by myself. Uh, you don't really see it in writing in too many places. Um, the plants in front of me are semi-dwarf apple trees. They're about 15 years old. You can see the main trunk of the tree. And so this has uh, been in here for a few years. My trees between pruning's probably grow upwards towards uh, 10 or 12 feet in the air. Um, every winter when I come in here to prune, what I do is I take back almost 100% of last year's growth back to little two bud spurs in the top of the tree. All the fruiting actually takes place on the older wood in the trees off of some fairly long-lived fruiting spurs. Now I periodically will take branches in the tree that have dangled too low because of fruit load. Uh, like these here are going to start getting in my way right there. They're on my path. And so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to cut those off this winter after the fruiting's finished. Uh, that'll help renew some of the fruiting spurs in the trees. But in general, uh, I managed to keep the trees to a very compact size here in my yard by just simply removing 100% of last year's growth. I've been doing that ever since the trees were about 8 to 10 years old. Another technique that can be used for keeping apple trees short is to turn the trunks sideways when they're put in. Here's two trees. The forward one is a Beverly Hills apple, and the one behind it over here is a Cox Orange Pippin. Both of them, the trunks are laid in at about a 45 degree angle to the ground. Now what that does is it slows down the growth of the trees so they stay more compact. The trees do not grow as vertical when they've been put in on an angle. It would be a, the, the simplest form of pleaching a tree which is usually the interweaving of branches but the intentional tipping of the trunk at 45 degrees uh, it's probably one of the easier ways you can get a tree to remain small. Now the uh, fruit load on these trees, again, is pretty much all on these uh, fruiting spurs right here. They're the short, knobby little twigs. Um, that's where all the apples come from. All right here, I see we've got a little damage, and this is what we'd be looking for in August. Go ahead and take these out of the tree. That fruit has a coddling moth larva on the inside of it. And so by taking it out now and disposing of it properly, and that means putting it about a foot and a half in the ground with a shovel, or sending it out uh, to the municipal compost facility. Uh, the, I wouldn't throw this directly into my home compost heap. It doesn't often get hot enough to kill these worms, so they just come right back out. Anyway, you know, taking them out of the tree, sanitation, and picking them up from the ground, too. Uh, we've just got done out here picking up all the windfalls because most of the windfalls actually had worms in them. I just love growing apples. Uh, just They're amazing. Look at the, the bounty here and all the different varieties you can raise. Um, this one here is mostly a Cox Orange Pippin, uh, which is an uh, old English apple. It raises really well here in the Bay Area. It, uh, it's very compact. It's got heavy fruiting spurs in the core of the tree. Uh, keeping this tree short with a fruit load to the, right close to the ground is an easy thing. But I also have other grafts in here. I refer to this tree as Frankensteina. Um, it has probably about 12 different varieties of apples stuck on the same trunk with the Cox Orange. From this angle, uh, it's a little easier to see that the crop in the tree is all in the older wood. And then there's these shoots up above. That is what has grown this year on the tree. Last year, I removed everything that was up there. 
Um, I did that the year before, and the year before that, and so on. Uh, again, this Cox Orange is a semi-dwarf tree, and it takes rather rigorous pruning to keep it the size. But over here on this end of the garden, I have what's called a pole apple, or colonnade apple. Now these grow vertical, like Italian cypress or Lombardi poplars. They are very compact. The trees do not produce a lot of excessive growth. Uh, fruits in real tight clusters along the branches. Uh, they're really wonderful in small spaces, and they're particularly good for people who are challenged by pruning. Another shot here of the Cox Orange Pippin with its New Year's growth on top that's removed every year. Right next to it here we have a pair of the pole apples. These trees have never been pruned, except maybe to remove some diseased wood if fire blight got in there, or maybe a broken piece of wood. Otherwise, I've never pruned these trees in the 15 years that they've been here in my garden, um, whereas the semi-dwarf apples and the dwarf apples require heavy pruning. Um, the fruit on many of these colonnade apples is actually uh, quite early. Right here, this one's ready to go. This is the... Uh, Ultra Spire. Uh, it's, a, it's a good tasting apple. High quality and it's quite early. Uh, I have to remember to get myself out here to get these early colonnade apples picked before they start right falling. Here is one of my favorite uh, pole apples. This is the uh, Golden Sentinel. Golden Sentinel is a nice golden apple. Uh, reminds me a bit of the density of a Jonathan. Uh, it's got a really good flavor. Maybe even a little crab apple in there. It's an unusual taste. Um, over here we've got North Pole that makes big red apples that are actually quite similar to Macintosh. So they'll be ready in about a week or two. Here we have another semi-dwarf tree. Um, for reference, there's my six-foot redwood fence right there next to it. Uh, this tree is Ein Schemmer. That's an Israeli form of the Golden Delicious. Um, it's a low chill apple. This apple will probably bear in places that barely get 200 hours of chilling every year. Here in the Bay Area, we do not get a lot of chilling. Uh, 425, I think, is typical for Fremont. Um, the uh, uh, Einschemmer is actually possible to be grown in places like Israel. Uh, it might have a prayer in Florida. Uh, it's one of the apples that people attempt to grow on the island of Hawaii. Well, here's one everybody knows. This is the uh, Golden Delicious Apple. Now, this tree happens to be a dwarf. Um, I haven't put it in on a 45 degree angle. It's straight up and down. Uh, it's pretty easy to keep in size. I do have to prune this one every year, uh, but not real hard. Here's one of my favorite ugly duckling apples. This is the Hudson's Golden Gem. It was found growing wild around an orchard in Oregon back in the 1930s. Apple is excellent for all purpose, cooking, baking, eating fresh out of the hand, uh, making cider, and so on. It's a, it's a very sweet apple, and it's got a skin that's about as pretty as a potato. Uh, russet apples in general tend to have high sugar contents, ugly as sin, and absolutely delicious. And I have the Hudson's Golden Gem apples worked into my Granny Smith tree. Uh, Granny Smith and Hudson's Golden Gem both have rather upright, fairly vigorous growth habits, so they work together pretty well on the same tree. Um, I like the Granny Smith for the fact that grannies uh, don't even harvest around here until about Thanksgiving. If the weather's decent, I can often leave them on the tree to as late as Christmas. So this is our latest apple, and when they're taken down in good condition, they will store usually until the month of May. Uh, just a marvelous fruit. Over here is some more of the Hudson Golden Gems. And over here I've got a branch of an heirloom apple called Cinnamon and Spice. This is really a delicious apple and the namesake uh, is no lie. It really does taste kind of spicy. That's a marvelous little fruit. Um, over here we started originally with an Akane, uh, which is a Japanese apple. Um, sister cross to Fuji. And then Grafted on some Roxbury russets over here. Um, over here we have Dorset Goldens. Uh, those are absolutely delicious. Right here is a branch of L-Star. L-Star is a little Belgian apple. Uh, it's a real delicious one and it's quite early too. We're just about ready to pick these by the middle of August. This is a German apple uh, called Pinova. 
Um, it's <laughs> that's like clumps of grapes. Real good apple. Uh, I believe it is a cross between the Cox Orange Pippin and one of the delicious like golden. I'm pretty sure that's what it was. I know it's got Cox Orange Pippin in its breeding. Anyway, uh, it's a real good apple. It can get scab. That's these polka dots here. Uh, we can get scab in this area on susceptible varieties. Uh, if I was selling these commercially, I would probably have to treat for it. But because I just eat them here or share them with friends, I really don't worry about it much uh, because it doesn't completely destroy the fruiting. Mm, here's a cluster of golden russet apples. Again, some of those potato-looking fruits uh, that are so sweet and irresistible. So that was a quick walk around the apple orchard in August. Apples are one of my favorite fruits. There are so many varieties of apples out there. That was just a smattering of the ones in this yard. Um, there is an apple tree for every climate in the United States. You could grow apples in literally 50 states. Um, so there's no excuse that you don't have at least one or two apple trees in your landscape. They make wonderful shade trees. They don't get too large and they bear, of course, delicious apples. We all know the story of Johnny Appleseed. This nation was built on apples. Thank you very much. Have a lovely time in your apple orchard.